Welcome, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Matt Gaudio, and I work as a consulting partner practice lead focused on the digital workplace at Amazon Web Services. Amazon, in general, focuses on reducing costs to our customers. Um, we try to reduce the costs to us in terms of scale as we grow and pass those savings along to reduce costs to you. Today, we won't be talking about that part of cost optimization. We're going to talk about um, cost optimization of your consumption of a specific service and Amazon Web Services, Amazon Workspace is our desktop as a service solution. Um, let's get started. So here's the agenda. We're going to cover a few things. We're going to start off um, uh, comparing alternatives to desktop as a service in the form of workspaces and looking at what virtual desktop infrastructure might cost both on-premises um, and how it would look um, in AWS as well and look at some of the reasons why you'd end up here in the first place um, before we get into optimizing your consumption. Uh, then we're going to get into the cost variables for Amazon Workspaces. So the instance types, so what scale of, of compute power do you need, what operating system, stuff like that. We'll talk about our bundles. Um, we'll talk about the running mode, and all these things will be clear by the time we're done. Then we will talk about a tool that we offer to our customers. Uh, it's a free service called Workspace's cost optimizer that lets you automate some of the process around reducing those costs. And that'll be clear by the end of this as well. Uh, and then we'll close out with a discussion about the value that our, our partners can add in your deployment so that you can maximize costs. These partners can do more than that, and many of you have probably worked with them already. But we're going to focus specifically on what they can do for you around reducing costs, costs with Amazon Workspaces, and we'll jump into a few examples of those. So I promised to start off at first comparing alternatives. And so this chart in front of you that you're looking at represents three possible deployment models for how you would cover desktop access for end users. Uh, on the very, very left, we're looking at on-premises virtual desktop infrastructure. In the middle, we've got virtual desktop infrastructure moved to AWS. And then we've got a fully managed desktop as a service in the form of Amazon Workspaces. Um, going back to the left, one of the things that's interesting, if you look at the color codes here, this one is all orange. Orange represents what the customer would manage. The blue on the, the subsequent columns will represent the service managed, so what, what the provider will manage, in our case, Amazon. The on-premises VDI scenario involves a very large, if you look at the first half of that stack, um, hardware component. So we need to build out that hardware. Not only do we need to procure and have a capital expenditure, and then configure and, and set up that hardware and have a physical place to put it. But we also need to scale that hardware to cover our high water mark or, or our peak demand, if you will. So an example of what I mean by that is if I've got, say, a thousand employees today working in um, some contact center, uh, and let's say there's a peak demand time, let's say I'm a retailer, and around the holidays I see a huge uptick in the need for inbound contacts in my contact center, Let's say that doubles, and now I've got to have 2,000 users access this system. In that column on the left, I've got to have enough hardware to support 2,000 users, even though I may only consume that for a month or two out of the year. The other 10 months, that's just idle hardware sitting in my data center. Um, I've also got to then procure licensing and configure everything at the top half of this. If I move to virtual desktop infrastructure on AWS, I can completely remove the hardware piece. Um, now, when I need to go from 1,000 to 2,000 users, I don't need to procure new hardware. I don't have to address the peak demand. I simply can ask for more, um, consume what I use, pay for what I use, and then roll it back when that season's over. So I'm not responsible for procuring hardware to meet peak demand. Um, the second half of the stack, where we look at a lot of the configuration, you look at things like VDI licensing, for instance, that still may need to be designed for peak demand. So I'm still going to have to procure those licenses. I manage that environment. But I have removed some of the, the components at the bottom. That means that moving to the cloud with our existing, exactly what we're doing in the current world of virtual desktop infrastructure, can reduce cost and complexity of management and give me greater elasticity simply by moving there with the same exact solution, no change at all in behavior. Now, if we move all the way over to the right and we look at Amazon Workspaces, what we're seeing is even more of that stack has been moved away from the customer and back on Amazon. So we'll manage all of this stuff all the way up to the VDI control plane on top of the hypervisors and everything that you'd have to manage on premises or VDI in the cloud um, and leave you with basically controlling access, who and what has access to the system and when can they do it, uh, and what do the images look like? So what, what kind of software is installed and policies and things like that that I create 
very, very high level in the stack. And I've got great elasticity in my licensing and my configuration and everything. In fact, at Amazon, with many tens of thousands of users using workspaces every day, there's just a two-person client engineering team that manages all of that. Um, so there, there's the hard costs, and there's also those, you know, those folks can do other things rather than spend all this time managing the desktop. So now we'll drill in a little further into this and look at a financial view. So the first view was really primarily around what you have to manage and what you have to have and, and deal with. This looks at it economically. Um, and if you look at the stack on both sides, we've got a comparison of on-premises virtual desktop infrastructure. Amazon Workspaces on the left is a 100 user example, on the right is a 1,000. Um, in both cases, we've got a very long list of, of, um, of things that we need to add to our environment, and we need to scale those to, to peak demand. This example is an apples to apples, so 100 users scaled for 100 users. Doesn't take into account that scenario I talked about with elasticity. Um, what you do notice, though, is that the 100 user example, we're saving two thirds of our cost, and on the 1,000 user example, 50% of our cost. It's a pretty significant savings, not to mention the, the hard to quantify benefit of elasticity and growing up and down as I need to. And when you're in a year like 2020 where that kind of thing can happen at massive scale and suddenly your entire workforce has to work from home except it with, um, compared to maybe before where a handful of folks at any given time were working remotely. So we've got to deal with that elasticity. That comes in when you move to workspaces and it's very hard to quantify that part, but already we're saving some money here. Um, what I would say is these examples, if you're looking at these and saying, oh, my storage is a different cost than that, or my servers for that scale will be something else. This is an example. It's based on a, a real example of a customer, but everyone buys their technology differently and has you know, different preferences and, and choices and skill sets. So these numbers will vary. I would recommend that you reach out to your AWS account manager um, and work with that individual and possibly also with an end user computing specialist at AWS to build out um, analysis of your actual spend in virtual desktop infrastructure and how that would look with workspaces. As you'll see as we go through this, our pricing is very transparent for workspaces, all published on the, on the internet. Every single option you can buy is there. So building out the right side of that column, which as you can tell, is a much shorter list of items and leading to that lower cost is very easy to do. So let's look at the considerations, the cost variables directly related to consumption of Amazon workspaces. So the system size is the first one we'll talk about. And that, that's a range, right? There, there are various bundles, um, and we'll talk about all the bundles in a moment, so I won't drill too deep into there. This is a specific example of um, a bundle from the US West region for Windows bundle. Um, and we'll talk about the others in a moment, as I said. This ranges from at the low end, a single CPU, low memory, um, you know, small storage, all the way up to, you know, a lot of CPUs, 16 of them, in fact, a lot of memory, a lot of storage and GPU, all these things that are needed for certain use cases, of course, but not for most. So this range could be anywhere from 25 to almost $1,000. When you think about that, this becomes a very important component of your decision of whether, whether or not to spec this size or that in a machine. The cost is huge. You can save a lot of money by picking the right bundle. And we'll get into some of those details in a moment. 22 Windows bundles in the West region. Now, the next thing is the, the billing type. So are we going to be on hourly or monthly billing? All of these workstation bundles can be billed either way. And each individual user, based on their, their needed consumption, can be billed on one or the other. So that, that, this example, the two, two CPU, four gig RAM, it's one of our um, standard bundles for Windows, costs at a monthly price $35 a month, this example. Now, if I have a user that doesn't work full-time or doesn't use their workspace full-time, maybe they use it when they're remote um, traveling, maybe they use it for certain tasks that involve an application that doesn't run on the machine that they're sitting on, whatever the reason is, they might use that for a few hours a month. In that case, you can start to save money by charging them the hourly rate. You have a fixed cost of $9.75 plus $0.30 cents an hour. So now you're only going to be consumed for the number of hours you use that month for that user. And, and when they're low, that's going to be a much lower cost. Um, always on an auto stop is another variable that you need to look at when you're thinking about especially the hourly option because it's not a fixed price. It tallies over time. And so if I want to minimize that, I can set that workspace to auto stop. And what that means is after a period of inactivity, an activity timer, the workspace will shut down. Um, now, keep in mind, that's going to save you from billing on that workspace because it's not running when they're not using it. 
but keep in mind when you make that decision that you have to decide a little bit about performance. So think, if you will, of the example as an individual, if you sit down at a laptop or a desktop computer and you finish the day working and you shut that computer down. So completely shut it down, it's not drawing any power, it's not doing anything. If you do that, when you come back in the morning, typically you have to expect a minute or so to, to boot it back up. No different when you're running your workspace in the cloud, it's just still, still a Windows machine that's, that has to boot up. So keep that in mind, if, if that immediate access is somehow important to your business, maybe don't use auto stop. But when you're looking to save costs and that user can wait a little bit to start up, go ahead and do auto stop. Now the last variable is the region selection. Um, I'm aware that in most cases, your region selection is gonna be dictated by variables other than cost. Things like um, data residency. So do I have the workspace close to the right data location that, that complies with all the legal regulations around it, things like that. Um, it could also be driven by application proximity. So if I have, um, let's say um, my, app, so my application SAP is running in the US West region, I, I would very likely want to put the endpoint application there as well so that they, they're, they're, there's no latency between the front and back end. Um, that's going to drive it sometimes. Um, and, and so you're not always making the decision based on cost, but when you can, so, so keep in mind, if you've got all your users into one region and that region happens to be more expensive than one that might be closer to the end user, closer to the data, or it doesn't matter in that case, then look for the one with the lowest cost. So keep that in mind that, that the region does affect the cost. So when we look at workspaces bundle management, um, there are, in just this US West region that I've been using as, as an example, there are 62 different workspaces bundles. You can find them all at the URL at the bottom of this page. So aws.amazon.com slash workspaces slash pricing. Fully published pricing at any given day will be up to date. Um, you can pick the region. And then within the region, you can pick the, the type of bundle you want to look at, and you'll see a chart similar to this one. This one's formatted for the PowerPoint slide, but the exact same data is there. So you see the range from that one CPU example to the 16 CPU Graphics Pro workstation at the bottom that we used in a, a range of $25 to $9.99. Um, there are 22 of those Windows uh, license or bundles. There are also 22 Windows Bring Your Own License bundles, or BYOL. So if you select that option, you'll notice that the prices come down. Um, and that's another area to potentially save. If your license from Microsoft for Windows is, is portable and you have the ability to move it, that's certainly a question for, for your license agreement with Microsoft. But if you can use that license, you can come over here and spend less on workspaces because you're not also paying for the Windows component in it. And then lastly, we also have Win Linux bundles for those use cases where someone does not need a Windows desktop. You're going to see an, a significantly lower cost um, because we're using Amazon Linux to, to present the front end. Now, make sure that you're deploying the right bundles to each user. That's something that is, um, you know, you can certainly get into Cost Explorer and understand who's using what. But make sure that the user who is doing light web browsing, um, is, is doing chatting and email and things like that, that's all text-based, does not need, uh, you know, a four CPU, eight CPU system with a lot of RAM. They may think they do. A lot of times in, in, in general in the world, folks think a bigger, batter, better computer is going to get me better performance. Not always true. So pick the right one for the task and, and assign those groups of users the, the tools that get their job done, but you don't need to overspec it. And the other thing is you have the option, uh, in fact, it's a default option in workspaces that allows a user to request an upgrade to their, to their workspace, so change the, the bundle that they have, and they can self-select to do that. The problem with that is users, like I said, will always think that a bigger, badder, better workspace is going to get them better performance at the task at hand. Not always true. So what we'd recommend is that you have a workflow in place, um, a service portal type workflow where there's some approval that has to happen. When someone needs a better workstation, they may need it for an application that they're running and it makes sense. It also makes sense to audit that periodically so that um, if someone did upgrade a workspace for a specific task and that task is no longer relevant, you can pull it back and then reduce your billing again based on consumption. So this takes us to the Amazon Cost Optimizer, Amazon Workspaces Cost Optimizer. So this is a tool that's, that's available for free. We'll walk through the flow of how it works in just a moment. Um, it analyzes usage patterns. Um, it, it analyzes each individual user and how they use workspaces to figure out if either an hourly or a monthly billing option is best. 
and then can automate the process of making that switch based on passing thresholds at which you would potentially break even and start to save money by moving to the monthly model. Each individual is taken into account. The URL listed here will take you directly to the cost optimizer and its documentation. You can also just do a web search for Amazon Workspaces cost optimizer. If you don't want to type this long URL, I'll, I'll save you the, um, the terror of me reading it out to you as it's pretty long. So, so go ahead and look at that. It's got full documentation as well as the ability to, to download the cloud formation template associated with the Amazon Workspaces cost optimizer. So the first step is you're going to download the AWS cloud formation template and use cloud formation to automate the deployment. Once the template's downloaded, you'll launch the stack and, and, and the cloud formation template creates a cloud watch rule. Invoking the cost optimizer Lambda function once every 24 hours. So each, each day we'll look at um, the usage and determine if it passes the threshold. The Lambda function leverages Amazon Elastic Container Service to create an AWS Fargate definition to pull the AWS directory service to gather a list of all directories registered for Amazon Workspaces. The task checks total usage for each workspace and will convert monthly billing to hourly once your defined threshold has been reached. We're going to discuss this in a little more detail in a moment. Um, on the right side, you can see the identity and access management roles used by the AWS Lambda function, AWS Fargate container that are, that are used by the um, Amazon Workspaces cost optimizer. This will also be available in the documentation if you go to read it. So let's go through um, a brief example. So we'll use that same sample system, the standard workstation that we used earlier for pricing. It's, so we're familiar with it. The pricing on that workstation is $35 per month, again, as a reminder, or $9.75 per month and 30 cents per hour. So you can manually choose these things or, or we can automate it, which is what we'll talk about in a moment. Now, to calculate the break even, quite simple, it's, you know, what are my fixed costs? $35 on the monthly, $9.75 on the hourly option. What's the difference? Divide that by the per hour cost, quite simple um, equation there, nets us 84.2 hours. So if that user of this workstation at its current pricing were to pass 84.2 hours, at that point, hourly billing would start to cost you more. And, and we don't want that. We want to stay at the most cost-effective scenario. So what we will do is configure the cost optimizer to set a threshold limit of 84 hours for that workspace that you're using. So that now every time anyone during the course of a month passes 84 hours of consumption, they move to monthly. So you don't have to start off your month with everyone on monthly so that you can have a predictable cost. You know that's your max cost, but the users that use less can be billed hourly, and you could actually see a lower cost that month if they don't pass the threshold. If this seems like a simple process, I will say it was quite simple. Um, as a non-technical user myself, um, I was able to go into um, the AWS console, spin up a few workspaces, and then launch the cost optimizer from the point where I hit the page and then started reading the documentation and deploy it, um, took me about five minutes. And it was, op it was working and showing me the interface and able to, to review those workspaces once a day. It's a simple process. It's highly recommended that anyone who's using workspaces do it, um, especially if there's some variability in how your users access the system. So next step is looking at our partner solution. So, the AWS partners that have invested in the digital workplace, um, including uh, Amazon Workspaces, have a depth, of, depth and breadth of experience that goes back several years. So they've done this many, many times. They can offer a lot of value to your organization in, in, in deploying and gaining significant value out of Workspaces. But today we're going we're to give some examples of how they can do that specific to cost management. Keep in mind, these folks can do a lot more we're going to focus in this, com in this conversation around cost management. Um, there are consulting partners that have gone through a, a rigorous validation in the form of our competency for digital workplace. And there are also technology offerings that can add value potentially to automate more tasks in the cost management perspective. Uh, and again, in that case, as well as the consultants, there are many other things they can do. So it's not limited just to cost management. So here we've got a list of our consulting partners that have gone through that process of validation through competency. 
You can find them all on our partner um, finder, which is detailed here, partners.amazonaws.com. Um, if you need to find a partner that has the skill set you need, I'd recommend you go here, and you can certainly filter by end-user computing or digital workplace to find one that's, that's got these capabilities. Um, we're going to drill into a few examples of how these folks have helped their customers to save money with Amazon Workspaces. So Nuvins, um, it's one of our UK partners that's, and I'll, I won't say it each time, but all six of these are competency partners that have been validated. They were working with a fleet management company that had about 1,300 Amazon Workspaces deployed. Um, they were using a tool that they created called the Nuvins Workspaces Manager. So this is intellectual property created by Nuvins that is available on the Amazon AWS marketplace. Um, in, in evaluating their deployed workspaces, they found about $15,000 a month in savings, primarily from about 300 orphaned, underused, or unused workspaces that were out in their environment. They also tend to automate, this tool automates many of the administrative functions, and that customer was able to see reduction in the amount of administrative work they had to do, which, which leads, obviously, to some cost savings. So Synchronet is another one of those partners. Um, they were working with a household appliance manufacturer to evaluate their workspace's environment. They took the customer through their cost optimization program, which includes uh, their, a tool called Synchronet Click, another product that's available on the marketplace um, that they've created as their own intellectual property. Um, so the, the immediate results of that program they took them through were felt by the customer in the form of a 44% reduction in their workspace's cost just in the first month alone. Next, we've got Alciant. They worked with a not-for-profit organization that was looking to grow their workspaces deployment from about 221 to about 1,500 workspaces. They were quite concerned with the costs they were experiencing initially with the first 221, which gave them some concern to move forward. Um, they, um, they used Cost Optimizer, Alciant did, to manage the, the running mode based on consumption. So the exact same tool I showed you, they helped walk the customer through of that. Um, additionally, they built a uh, custom Lambda function that works to make decisions on whether or not a, a workspace is created or, or, or brought down based on AD group membership. So we no, they no longer left those orphan scenarios in this customer so that if someone was moved into a group that should have a certain type of workspace, it was provisioned. Um, and if they were moved out of that group or left the organization, it was deprovisioned. So all of these things together led to a savings of about $8,000 per month for this customer, allowing them to grow to that larger um, workspaces footprint. So Cloudhesive helped a large global cruise line that deployed about 2,000 workspaces. They helped the customer modernize first from an on-premises VDI to Amazon workspaces. So right there, they were adding value and helping that customer make the migration, if you remember the, the three stacks of what you have to manage and pay for from earlier. Cloudhesive leveraged their centricity offering, which is another one of the intellectual property pieces on the Amazon marketplace from our consulting partners. Um, they used that along with a tool from Liquidware, one of our uh, ISV competency partners, to monitor usage and adjust consumption accordingly. In the process, the customer decreased support, support tickets by 55% and reduced downtime by 45%. So the next partner on the list is Consegna. They helped a government agency identify about 500 workspaces that were not in optimal running mode or were the wrong um, bundle for the use case that the customer was using, some of those things we've already talked about. Um, they converted the workspaces to the appropriate mode and bundle um, needed by that agency and reduced their workspaces bill by about $8,000 in the first month. And now they're looking to potentially increase that to about 12,000 based on additional findings. Lastly, Incudo worked with an insurance industry customer to deploy 250 workspaces. So by evaluating the customer's usage of workspaces, they were able to recommend, based on analysis of how they're using the apps, recommend the, that certain resource-heavy applications um, or just specific tasks with an application that were causing them to use too high-powered of a workspace bundle. Um, that was driving up their costs significantly. By moving those resources that had high compute requirements to AppStream 2.0, another one of our end user computing services, and then connecting those AppStream presented applications into their workspaces environment, they were able to scale down workspaces and save about 25% off their workspaces cost. So 
In addition to these examples, there are innumerable additional examples from these partners in helping customers to save costs on Amazon Workspaces and many of our other solutions. So we'd, we'd highly recommend you reach out to one of them and, and get an understanding of what they can do to help you as well. So in summarizing, we walked through a few different areas that are relevant to cost management for workspaces. The first was, how, how do we compare virtual desktop infrastructure on-premises in AWS and then compare those two to workspaces, which is a fully managed desktop as a service? And we saw that the reduction in, in potential capital expenditure and management costs, um, as well as gaining elasticity, the workspaces model is significantly less expensive as, as high in the examples we used as two-thirds of the cost reduced. Um, so, so that simple move, and, and one of the examples we looked at with a partner was a migration from uh, VDI on-premises to uh, AWS and workspaces. So the next thing we looked at was bundle types. So there's a huge range of bundles. In the one region we looked at today, there were 62 different bundles, each one with its own uh, re requisite pricing. So understanding the use case of each one of those users and each of those groups of users and optimizing the right workspace bundle for that user population is an important consideration when you, when you try to figure out how to minimize costs. Uh, the next thing we looked at was the running mode and the billing type. So we can, we can have an auto stop or an always running workstation. Um, by auto stopping after a period of inactivity, we can stop billing on an hourly workspace. And then we've got the ability to bill monthly or hourly. The hourly comes with a fixed cost and a per hour and the monthly is a fixed cost. Um, using the cost optimizer, we learned, can help you automatically migrate from hourly to monthly whenever that threshold is passed by each individual. So you're maximizing the use of the solution. And then we talked a, a bit about partners and how they can add value for you. So both our technology and our consulting partners have solutions and offerings that can help you to, to minimize the cost for, for workspaces and get maximum value out of the solution. You can find those solutions at the two URLs we have here. Um, I'd say at least go to the partner finder and filter by end user computing or digital workplace and look for those that have been validated by AWS to be able to provide these solutions and, and that we know have a history and past that can help you do better with managing costs on workspaces. And then the last two links on this slide, if you're interested in learning more, if you're new to our, our services, the first link is an introduction to the end user computing services from AWS. Um, it, will, it will give you a general understanding of where workspaces, AppStream, and WorkDocs fit um, as solution sets and try to give you an understanding of how you might use them. Um, the second link here is an intermediate training on workspaces that is a little bit longer and goes a little bit deeper. Definitely recommend you take a look if you're interested in becoming a, a little more expert about workspaces and, and the kind of things you can do with it. So with that said, I'd like to thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope that you got value out of this presentation. I enjoyed putting it together and delivering it. I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.